let me uh, tell you a little bit about my personal spiritual life. Uh, I have always believed that the most important book in the world is the Bible. I can't remember a time when I didn't know that the Bible was God's Word. But for many years, uh, I neglected personal reading of the Bible. Until uh, several years ago, when I was a young man, I felt like I needed to read the Bible every day. So I started to read every day from God's Word. Some days it's just a few verses. And other days I get caught up and just read and read and read. Now, I, I know that there are some people uh, who have difficulty with reading. I know that there are some people, uh, some people in my family, who can read, but they don't understand what they're reading. There are some people who just don't have the ability to read. Whether you can read or understand or not, getting God's Word into our lives is important. I believe this with all my heart. So several years ago, I made a commitment to myself and to the Lord. That, that every year, from January to December, I would read the whole Bible. Some years I go from Genesis to Revelation. Other years I read the New Testament, then the Old Testament. Or I'll use another system to read the whole Bible. But something is happening in my life because. God's Word is getting settled in me. It's changing the way I think. And it's changing the way I live. So earlier this year, I had an experience when I was reading in the book of Acts. Now, uh, I often write in my Bible. I make notes. I'm, I use different markers to use colors in my Bible. <laughs> There's, there are some pages of my Bible that uh, there are as many things written by me as there are printed on the page. And the passage at the very end of Acts chapter 2 is one of those that is my one of my favorites. I read it a lot. I have preached from it many times. It helps me understand how to be a Christian disciple. <laughs> But when I read through this passage this spring, some different thoughts occurred to me. Let me read for you 
uh, several <laughs> verses, but then especially we'll focus on one. Kapsome, kapsome, kita mje chume chuo, eni yezidi ya ni ata tu jafute kake sira kunyerulumu wa kuvasi muba. This is uh, the story of the very first church. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to him. And they continued... And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. In the breaking of bread and prayer. Then fear came upon every soul. And many signs and wonders were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common. And sold their possessions and goods. They divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple. And breaking bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Now always before when I've read this passage, I've focused on what I'm supposed to do as a Christian. Like Bible study and prayer, worship and ministry. Or I have focused on the things that God does for those who follow Him. He gives them favor with the people. He, make, he makes them generous. He calls them to do ministry. There are lots of things that we do, and there are lots of things that God does. Sometimes I've focused on the number of people that get saved. On the day of Pentecost, it says 3,000 people were saved. Later in the passage, it says, People were being saved every day. It was a true revival. But this time, as I read it, God showed me something different. It was new, at least for me. And maybe it will be helpful for some of you, especially you pastors. Or those of you that God is calling to be pastors. Here's what I noticed about the very first church. They had no money. They, they didn't have any resources. The, the people who were in the congregation had to help each other. They didn't have great resources 
to have special programs and speakers. They didn't have the funds to make a difference in their community. But not having money didn't keep them from doing the work of God. Not having money, not having money was a hindrance to the gospel, but it didn't stop the gospel. We church people need to stop using that excuse that we don't have the money. Here's, here's what I believe. God will make a way when there seems to be no way. Amen. Amen. So they had no money. There's the second thing I discovered in this passage. They didn't only have no money, their teachers, their preachers had no education. The disciples were the most trained of anyone. And they had never been to school. They, yeah. did, they didn't go to Bible college yeah, or seminary. They had just spent time with Jesus. And in my denomination, the United Methodist Church, in my country, in the United States, if you want to be a pastor of a church, you have to complete primary school and secondary school. You have to go to college or university for four years. And then you have to attend seminary and study to be trained how to be a pastor. And that takes another three years. The requirements for education are so great that there are many people who never become pastors. They're discouraged because it's so hard. But the first pastors in the first church in the Bible they didn't go to seminary. They didn't go to college. They maybe didn't even know how to read or write. But they knew the gospel. They knew that Jesus had called them. They knew what they were to do with their work. The Apostle Paul is one who tells us that he didn't have a lot of training. Now he was a leader of the Jewish people. And he had a Jewish education. And he was a very smart man. But he says when he first became converted, that he met James and Peter for a few days. But the education that he got 
came from the Holy Spirit. That's the kind of education we need. These first pastors didn't let not having training keep them from serving God. We, we have made it a rule as a part of Kwanda to say that if God has called you to be a pastor, we're going to try to help train you to be a pastor. You should get as much training as you can. But you should never let your training keep you from sharing God's love. I, that was the second thing I learned. They had no money and they had no education. The third thing I learned, or that I realized, was that they didn't have any buildings. The scripture that I read for you a moment ago says that they met in the temple. They had worship in the Jewish place of worship. They borrowed the area where they worshiped. They didn't have a church building. They didn't just confine themselves to the temple, though. They also worshipped in homes, from house to house. They didn't have church buildings. Here in uh, Kavule, Kavuli? Yes. Kavuli? Kavule. 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 Yeah. Here in Kavuli, you're blessed to have a building. A place devoted to the worship of God. When people go by, they know if there's... When people go by on the road, they know if we're in here that we're worshiping God. <laughs> but you might be called you might be called to go to a place where there isn't a church building. Don't let that keep you from spreading the gospel. God has revealed in his word that he can be worshipped anywhere. He can be worshipped in our homes. He can be worshipped in a church building. He can be worshipped in another public building. He can be worshipped under a tree. In fact, I think that we're supposed to worship God every day whether we're in a building or not. Don't let let me uh, one more thing. Uh, in America uh, we have a big problem. We have a lot of big problems, really. Well, but I, I'm only going to talk about one of them right now. It's fair. <laughs> Our big problem that I want to talk about is that we have equated the church with the building.
Ngaba. Tujifana nyiriza nekizimbe. But a, a kanisa is not the same as a building. Nyate kanisa siachimu nekizimbe. You should have said church at that part. When I said Kanisa, you should have said Church. Okay, fine, fine. Yeah. <laughs> That's right, exactly. In fact, the, the word the Bible uses for church, Kanisa, is Ecclesia. Ecclesia. The Ecclesia. Ecclesia really means those who are called out. In the original language, the church is the people of God. If we all walked out that door right now, and, and walk down the road and made a big circle around a tree the church would be down the road by the tree this would still be a building you can have church anywhere don't let not having a building keep you from having a church. Amen. Amen. I want to pray. Dear God, we are grateful for your presence here. We thank you because we know you're here. <coughs> we have heard you speaking to our hearts. <coughs> we have felt your presence in the worship. <coughs> we feel your vo we hear your voice speaking to us even now. <coughs> now God, our prayer is that you would help us to get over the obstacles we have. Father, may we not be a people of excuses, but a people of action. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 How about, uh, how about if we see if there are any questions? Of anything we have covered today? Any questions? Any questions? Any questions? Any questions? Any well then, let, if, if, no questions? It seems. it seems there are no questions. Well then, let me, uh, let me talk to you for five more minutes, then I'm going to sit down and we're all going to take a break. Uh, I have mentioned several times today uh, about the uh, vision for Kawanda to be evangelizing and planting churches. And part of the vision is to find and recruit men and women who are called to plant churches and pastor. So I want to make an invitation to all of you here today, uh, if you feel God calling you in that direction uh, to contact uh, before today's over, uh, either Bishop Fred or Pastor John or myself.
Ukwa lukta ni kama kanisa, kugendo kumuli ya ingiru ni kama kanisa. Usolo kusenga na umulabi lizi uh, Fred, oba Nze, oba Pastor Dio. Uh, we would love to uh, get, get, stay in touch with you and help you in the process of getting ready to start that church. Also, if you are already currently pastoring a church, uh, we want uh, to invite you to consider affiliating with us uh, as a part of the Kwanda International Family. Amen. Amen. I was just thinking the same thing. Uh, so uh, one more thing I'm going to do. We preachers are notorious for saying, I have one more thing seven more times. I was worried because I knew that was funny and if you didn't get some laughs. Uh, I have a, a favorite verse in the Bible and I want to share that with you just as we're closing today. Many of you know this verse very well. It's John 3.16. I sometimes uh, refer refer to this as the basics of the gospel. Here's what it says. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Here's why it's the basics of the gospel. Because it says that God loves everybody. He loves all of us in this room. There is not a single person in this place that he does not love. No matter who you are or where you are from, God loves you. No matter what you have done or what your life is like, God loves you. You may be the greatest sinner in all of Kavuli. And nobody in town may like you. People might avoid you. But God loves you. In fact, that verse says that God loves you so much that he gave you a gift. He gave his son for you. And for me. In the olden days, in the Jewish religion, there was a requirement to be forgiven of sins, you had to make a sacrifice. God came up with this ingenious plan to do away with that system. He sent his son who became a perfect sacrifice for us. He's willing to take on all of our sins. And make us whole and new. God loves you. 
God gave you his son. Here's all we've got to do. The verse says, whoever believes in him will not perish. All it, all it takes is believing in Jesus. Whatever your sins are, if you believe in Jesus, he'll take them away. He'll help you overcome those temptations. Amen. So, all we've got to do is hear him speak and listen to him convicting our hearts and forgiving us our sins. And if we believe in Jesus, do you know what happens? The verse says we have everlasting life. He loves, he gives. We believe, we live. We have the promise that if Jesus lives in our heart, we have a guarantee of eternal life together with him. You know what a great thing for me is to know that someday when I get to heaven, I'm going to get to spend a lot of time with you, brothers and sisters. And I want to make sure that everyone here has the opportunity to have that life, that hope, that promise. Amen. Amen. Is there anyone here today who wants to have a relationship with Jesus, who wants to be born again, who has heard God speaking to your heart this day? Anyone? <laughs> I, I, if, if you have not met Jesus and you'd like to today, I will not do anything unusual to you. I just want to pray for you and welcome you into the family of the kingdom of God.